There are a handful of, of types of movie scenes that directors, filmmakers return to over and over again, right? Real familiar conventions and beats that, that we're used to seeing in, in different types of movies. Uh, one of my absolute favorites of these kind of common, conventional uh, movie scenes is what we might call the roundup scene. Maybe you know what I'm talking about. A, a lot of movies have these scenes where one or two of the characters formulate an idea about a mission that they want or need to accomplish. Uh, maybe it's in a movie like Ocean's Eleven. It's, it's a big heist where uh, Danny Ocean has to round up everybody for the team. Or uh, in The Mighty Ducks, it's a, it's a game that the team needs to win, so they have to round up all the members of the team and get them back together for practice. Uh, maybe like in The Blues Brothers, it's a concert that they need to perform so they can save the orphanage, and so they have to, to go around and get together all the members of the band and bring them together in one place. And so several minutes will unfold in which the necessary participants for the, the bank robbery or the, the big tournament are sought out, wherever they are, and, and the main character talks them into joining up with the group. And these scenes are so great, partly because they're so predictable. And among the most predictable elements is that there's always going to be that one holdout. There's always going to be that person with a unique skill set. Maybe he's the only one who can crack the safe, who holds the loot. Or he's the only one who can drive fast enough to get away. He won't want to join, because he's left that life behind. He's not interested in that anymore. But nevertheless, usually the, the mastermind of the plot will be able to bring that person around. And will succeed in, in talking him into joining up. See, it's understood that without, uh, without the diverse set of experiences, without the diverse set of skills and specialized talents, that each of these team, team members brings to the table. There's no way they'll be able to pull the mission off. Sure, some of these people will be difficult to deal with. Some of them will be pretty risky propositions. Some of them might even be kind of shifty characters. But they're all different, and they're all necessary. Without any one of them, the story goes. It's impossible to see how the mission is going to reach its desired end. And because everyone operates with this understanding, they eventually come together to to rob the bank or get the victory or save the day before they ride off into the sunset. If only it were that simple in real life. There's a reason why each of these movies ends the same way, with the gang breaking up again, going their separate ways, and staying clear of each other until the next big break or the next opportunity comes around. <clears throat> Bringing different and diverse people together around a common purpose is one thing. As the old saying goes, it takes all kinds. All kinds of people, with all kinds of gifts and all kinds of personalities. We're often willing to admit this. We're often willing to concede to the difficulty of, of pulling together all these kinds of people for a short time. Whether it's a, a group project or a big community initiative that we want to see unfold. Getting people to stay together. Getting people to, to share life with one another. To, to sustain the relationship beyond the big job or the championship game or the major event. That's a whole different proposition. The, the backbiting and, and pettiness and frustrations that so often emerge in this scenario isn't, these aren't exactly the, the kind of things that cinematic dreams are made of. Well, even though he, he lived and worked uh, a couple of millennia before the, the first Hollywood blockbusters beamed these kinds of stories into our imagination, the Apostle Paul knew a thing or two about getting the team together. Paul's life's mission seemed to be one of rounding up a, a bunch of diverse and distinctive characters, uniting them around a common purpose, pouring his time and energy into them, and then prayerfully hoping for the best. What's more, Paul wasn't just concerned with getting these people together, he was also concerned with helping them stay together, with sustaining the kinds of relationships that won't just last a couple of weeks or even a couple of years, but rather for generations. So that when the Son of Man returned, he would find faith on the earth. Now, while we see glimpses of this important and often frustrating work throughout Paul's writings, as well as in the story of his missionary work in Acts, it's in the letters of 1 and 2 Corinthians that we maybe get the fullest, messiest account of what this process looked like, with all its ups and downs. Paul had learned. He learned from his own experience on the mission field, as well as from the debates and disputes he witnessed as a member of the early church, just how important it is for people to bear with one another through the challenges and conflicts that they might face. And he knew that these challenges and conflicts, while a lot of them would come from outside the community, just as, yeah, it's just as likely that they would come from within. 
So as we read Paul's writings to the Corinthians, one of the, the things that becomes evident is that Paul is a realist. Paul knows that in any church community, there are going to be men and women who, for a variety of reasons, have trouble feeling like they're truly a part of what's going on. There are going to be people who have trouble really grasping or, or connecting with the larger vision or the larger mission of the church. And to his credit, Paul doesn't minimize this. Paul doesn't pretend that this is no big deal because Paul knows that these seemingly small issues, these nagging concerns that we carry around, including the feelings of insecurity and feelings of inadequacy and, and even alienation that we can sometimes feel within the context of community. Paul knew that, that these things can actually have an enormous effect on the life of the church. And so Paul wants to address these things in as practical and straightforward a way as he can. Throughout this first letter to the Corinthians, and, and at various points, Paul will put his pastor's cap on, and he, he tries to, to root down into some of these struggles. He tries to confront some of the thorniest problems that the church is facing. In the first verse of the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul declares to the church, Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. This matter of, of spiritual gifts has long been a vexing one. For the church. It certainly seems to have been in that case in the first century. It's long been a problem for individual Christians as well. It seems that the church at Corinth was, was wrestling with this matter in their life together. And I think there were a number of factors at, at work in this conflict. But at its heart, I, I think Paul is right in claiming that this is a matter of understanding. He doesn't want them to be uninformed. Spiritual giftedness is hard to understand. The, the role that, that what we might call spiritual gifts uh, play in the life of the church is sometimes tough for us to grasp. It's the kind of thing that's hard to quantify. Sometimes it's, it's hard to categorize. And the idea of spiritual giftedness is, is certainly hard to discern, especially in ourselves. And because of these difficulties, discussions of, of giftedness can sometimes bring us down. It can put us on the defensive. It can drag up all sorts of difficult emotions. And if these emotions are left to fester, they can lead to problems in the church community. This seems to have been the case in Corinth. Paul seems to, to be hearing reports back, as he, he, as he so often does throughout this letter, of some problems that this was causing. So he wants to address these things before they do any more damage. He continues in verse 4. He says, There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. So Paul begins this discussion by, by holding in tension two principles that are so key to our life together. Two principles that are really key to life in this world, but, but they become all the more pointed and all the more important when we're talking about life in the church. And these are the principles of diversity and unity. Paul acknowledges here that there are all different kinds of people in the church. He acknowledges that there are people who are gifted to serve in different ways. But he stresses three ways that these diverse people, that these different kinds of people are unified. He says they share the same spirit, they share the same Lord, and they share the same God. Paul seems to be using what we might call Trinitarian language here. Language of, of three in one. God is three in one. There is both unity and diversity bound up in God's nature, in the nature of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and how the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all work together to accomplish the mission of God in this world. And so there's also both unity and diversity bound up in the people that God has called his own. <coughs> Paul continues with this theme. He says, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between Spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And he distributes them to each one, just as he determines. Now, in this section, Paul is essentially giving us a sort of catalog. He's giving us a, a listing of different types of spiritual gifts that he sees at work in the church. And this list is impressive in its diversity. 
There is wisdom, there is knowledge, there is faith, healing, miraculous powers, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues. Yet, despite the, the staggering array of gifts and, and ways of service that Paul lists here, we can imagine a list that extends well beyond this. We can imagine a list that, that fills in all kinds of different ways that we've seen people serve the church and benefit the kingdom of God with their talents and their energies and their resources. I can just look around this room and I can start to calculate different ways that so many of you all are giving, some of which Paul lists here and some of which he doesn't. I could add to this list by saying some are given through the Spirit the gift of singing, or the ability to play music, or the gift of administration, or financial gifts, or managerial skills, or the gift of conversation, the gift of generosity, the gift of humility, the gift of compassion, the gift of technological savvy, the gift of being handy, the gift of working with kids, the gift of diligence, the gift of cooking, the gift of karaoke, the, the list goes on and on. The point is that there is a richness, there is a diversity, there is a wonderfully overwhelming plenitude of talents that God has gathered, even in a relatively small group of his followers. Paul must have felt the same sort of thing when he looked at the church of Corinth. He must have taken note of how that congregation was blessed beyond belief with gifts that could be used for the common good. And yet... And yet this same abundance of gifts, this same plurality of talents that could be such a boon to the church, could also become a problem. And that's because these gifts are necessarily, and, and by design, these gifts are attached to human beings. They reside within human beings. And do you know what else resides within human beings? Insecurities, anxieties, feelings of inadequacy, feelings of incompetence, feelings of jealousy. <clears throat> Paul saw it in the church at Corinth, where the members of that congregation were unable to rejoice in the gifts they shared. They were unable to exult in the, in the talents that God had graced them with for the common good. And the reason they were unable to do this is because there were some who thought their gifts were more valuable than others. They wanted to be center stage. They wanted to grab the spotlight for themselves at every gathering and, and put their accomplishments on display every chance they got. The church is lucky to have me these folks would say. And so, of course, there were also some who thought their gifts were less valuable than others. They just wanted to shrink back, or, or maybe even worse, to disconnect from the church altogether. No one would miss me. They grumbled to themselves. Well, Paul has some words for both of these groups. As he continues, he says, Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part is rejoices. The body metaphor is one that, that Paul has used before, and it's one that he'll use again. Frankly, this is, this is an image that never goes out of style. This is, a, this is an image, this is a metaphor that is just as relevant and just as resonant today as it was when Paul wrote these words. It's a reminder of, of both the diversity that makes us special, 
as well as the unity that makes us strong. And as a reminder, it's, it's hard to find a better image. As a symbol of the way that, that God has brought all kinds of people together, not just in a kind of reckless hodgepodge of humanity, not just in sort of a haphazard piling together of, of different kinds of people, but as an organic whole. And as an image of how God has accomplished that, the body is, is a tough image to be. We all know what it is to have a body. We all know what it is to live in a body. We all know what a glorious thing it can be when our body functions as it should. When all of the organs and the limbs and every part of us, down to the last nerve ending, is in tip-top shape. But sadly, we also know what it's like when even one part of our body, whether that part is a, a clogged artery or a sore elbow or a troublesome toenail, just isn't right. When Paul says that the suffering of one part is felt throughout the entirety of the body, we can literally feel the truth of that statement in our bones. But just because we know the truth behind this metaphor, just because we can intellectually acknowledge that, yes, the body is made up of many parts, and all of those parts are important, that doesn't mean we don't need to be reminded. We need the words of Paul to continually drive home the point that just as the body wouldn't be the same if an appendage was amputated, so too the church would suffer if our contribution to the whole, however large or small it might seem, suddenly disappeared. In our more insecure, maybe our more melancholy moments, we're all apt to forget this. But it's true. It's true for each one of you here. Without your words of encouragement, without your quiet service, without your unique skill set applied in ways that edify and challenge and instruct and strengthen others, this church would not be what it is. Without your willingness to use your gifts for God's kingdom, the body would suffer. This is a heavy reality, but it's also a happy one. We serve a God who has gifted us in amazingly diverse ways. We serve a God who has drawn us together for a common purpose. We serve a God who, in his infinite wisdom, takes all kinds and makes us one. Please pray. God, we thank you for your imagination. It's the imagination we see on display all the way back to the beginning of Genesis. Where we see you creating an abundance of life, an abundance of different kinds of creatures and abundance of, of different ways that your beauty and your goodness is revealed. But God, we also see that imagination on display in the church, where you create out of us a, a new body, a new creation, Lord, and you equip us in all kinds of ways with all different types of gifts and, and talents, with all different types of people and perspectives. And then you challenge us and you Equip us and you, you strengthen us that we might be one. We thank you for that gift, Lord. We, we pray forgiveness for when we lose sight of that gift. When we see it as more of a curse than a blessing. And we pray, God, that you would help us to attend to the people that are around us. Both in this room and in our community and in the world. That we might rejoice in in the wonderful ways that you, you call us to together to fulfill your purposes. It's in the name of your Son that we pray these things.